In this video, we're going to take a look at BGP pairings. When it comes to establishing BGP pairings, there's a several things that we need to break down in order to understand what we need to do. So, first and foremost, like IGP, first step in BGP is to find neighbors to exchange inter information with. Pretty obvious, right? Unlike IGP, BGP does not have its own transport. BGP has different types of neighbors. BGP neighbors are not discovered by default. BGP neighbors do not have to be directly connected. So let's let's sit on this uh, bullet, this particular subfeature for a moment and break this down. So does not have its own transport. So for one, BGP uses TCP port 179 for transport. And so basically, what that means is if you don't have a way of reaching the other end, it's not going to be able to form a TCP pairing. Now, I'm going to go into more detail on this in the upcoming slide, so I'm not going to dig, dig too deep into this. So unlike IGP, or I'm sorry, uh, yeah, unlike IGP, BGP needs to have some sort of mechanism in place in order for this to work. And as we go through, you'll see that IGP comes into play for that. I'll talk about that more when we actually get into the peering aspects of it. Has different types of neighbors. Well, you have internal and you have external. Each one has its own its, uh, administrative distance that is specific to the type of peering that it is. eBGP is a AD of 20 and IBGP is an AD of 200. AD meaning administrative distance and the lower the value the better the route or the better more preferred that particular path is. Now it also says that neighbors are not discovered by default. That is true to a point. Now um, one of the things you can do with BGP which actually makes it very scalable and, and I've done this with one customer um, a while back is using what they call dynamic neighbors. Now, if you've never heard of this feature, it basically makes BGP act like an IGP. And you have to use a peer group and specify the um, address blocks that you're going to be accepting TCP messages from, which is what you're going to be doing anyway when you configure the, the manual neighbor adjacencies. You simply create the neighbor statement, or the I should say you create the dynamic peering, and all you're doing is you're plugging in there if you receive a TCP message from a specific uh, address, so it's a source-based setup, then you're going to go ahead and you're going to dynamically learn that peering. This is good for DMVPN environments. The only drawback is to it, you would have to manually code in where you're going to be learning neighbor adjacencies from. So sometimes you'll have it in a VRF where you'll learn these neighbor statements and you'll just have a default 0, 0, 0, 0 in, which means I don't care where they're coming from, I'm just going to go ahead and peer with them, which is a little dangerous, if you ask me, but it is certainly possible to be done. Now, where this comes into play is where you have need a lot of scale. I wouldn't recommend doing this unless you have a specific reason for it, but it does come in handy uh, when you know what's going on and how they would actually go out and be done. Neighbors do not have to be directly connected to each other. This is true for IBGP. Um, where in eBGP, you can do this as well, but there's actually a couple things you have to do to make it work. Same thing with iBGP, and we'll talk about those later, where in iBGP, you're going to be setting the next, the update source to a specific uh, interface or specific IP address, and with eBGP, there's a couple things you can do, like disable connected check and eBGP multi-hop, and we'll talk about those more as we progress through. Now, when it comes to the BGP transport, BGP uses port 179 for transport. It implies that BGP needs IGP first. Now, why does it need IGP? For next top processing. So, let's take a, for, take a look at it from this perspective. The way this would work, and I'm going to go ahead and bring up the, uh, the next bullet point here. The way this works out here is if I have a BGP speaker, and I have another BGP speaker, and I'm in AS1, I'm in AS1. Then I also have another router over here that's in AS2. Okay. What this is actually going to do is normally what's going to be happening with routing in general is when I send traffic out this way or I send traffic out this way, the source IP address is going to be the outgoing interface that is closest to the destination. Simple as that. Now, if that's the case, great. But if I set my neighbor statement up to not peer to that IP address, what's going to end up happening is normally with IBGP, and, and this is going to be an IGP connection right here, this is going to be an eBGP connection. We'll talk about those, how they're actually going to work out. The idea here is if I'm iBGP, I'm not going to want to peer off the interface that's closest to the, the router that I'm peering with. Why? Why would I not want to do that? 
Well, the main reason is if I have some sort of link failure, my BGP peering goes down. Normally, you're going to peer off a loopback. Why a loopback? Because if that loopback is reachable from more than one direction, more than one circuit, or more than one interface, then that means you have redundancy built in. The reason why you're going to want to have this is you're going to, when you're setting this up, you're going to want to peer off of a loopback on the IBGP peerings. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to set the neighbor up to be the remote end. So let's say, for instance, this is, this is router 1, this is router 2, and this is router 3. Right. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say this guy's going to be one 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 one. This guy's going to be two 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 two. This guy will be three 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 three, etc. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say the neighbor statement to be neighbor, and then I'm going to say the IP address I'm going to want to peer with them on in two 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 two. I'm going to say the uh, and then the remote autonomous system number is going to be um, one. Right, that's going to be my statement. But I'm going to say set the update source to be loopback zero. Right, and that's going to do. I'm going to do that on both ends of the connection. Then what's going to be happening is, as long as two can reach one's loopback, and as long as one can reach two's loopback, that means I'm going to be able to form a peering with each other. If I can ping 1.1.1.1 from 2.2.2.2, that means I have reachability between the two routers, and that is the first thing that's needed in order to get this a whole shebang to work. As long as that's in place, I'm good to go. Now, because BGP neighbor statement tells the process to listen for remote address via TCP port 179, this is actually the server aspect of it. So you're going to say the I'm the well known the well known port is 179, which is always going to be the server. The client is going to initiate off of some other random port number that could be you know 12,111. What he's going to do there is he's going to set that up and he's going to send the traffic this way. The initiate, initiate a session to the remote address via TCP port 179. If there's a collision, if both of them try to send it out to this address, the higher router ID becomes a TCP client. Right? So the lower router ID becomes the server. And that's going to be how you go about doing this. Now, with eBGP, the same concept applies down here. So all these things right here apply to up here as well. Now with eBGP, you're not going to peer off of a loopback. You can, absolutely. And you'll see that's how typically you're going to get load balancing in place and stuff like that. The idea here that comes into play is when you're peering here, you're going to be peering off the IP address that is going to be directly connected to the link you're trying to peer on. Same thing over here. You're going to do that, and all is going to be good. You're going to see that pop in. You're going to go ahead and move forward with it, and that's going to be how you get operations up, up and running. You'll see this when we actually get into setting up eBGP and IBGP and how we're going to do that. I'll take a look at exa both examples and how that would come into play, but that's the general breakdown to how that would go about being done. Now when it comes to the BGP states, you have idle, connect, active, open sent, open received, and established. Now BGP idle is the initial state the BGP goes through in order to the initial state that BG, the BGP routing process enters when the routing process is enabled or when the device is reset. So you have that particular situation. The device waits for a start event. After the device receives a TCP connection request from a remote peer, the device initiates another start event to wait for a timer before starting a TCP connection to a remote peer. If the device is reset, then the BGP routing process returns to the idle state. Now what ends up happening here is basically what you're doing is you're waiting for something to happen. You're going to sit in idle until the remote end starts sending you BGP open sent. You're going to do open sent. And you're going to continue to do this. It's basically like the hellos for OSPF or ISIS. This information is going to be continuously sent. And you'll see this when we actually go through the implementation, you'll see the debugs and the Wireshark captures that we'll take a look at that will drive this point home. What will end up happening then is you'll go into BGP Connect once you've started receiving these open sense. Then what you're going to do is the, connect, the, the writing process detects that a peer is trying to establish a TCP session with the local BGP speaker. Okay. Then you go into Active. The BGP writing process tries to establish a TCP connection with a peer using the Connect Retry Timer. Start events are ignored while the BGP routing process is in the active state. The BGP routing process is reconfigured. Oh, sorry. If it, the process is reconfigured or an event error occurs, 
it will return to the idle state. Now, where this comes into play is you might have the wrong autonomous system number set up, the wrong IP address, the wrong update source. So there's different connectivity pieces that come into play and how they're set up. So if one side is configured and then the other side is configured, but they're not configured to match or to be the correct information aspects of it, then you'll have to be careful with that because you'll run into the situation where you'll be peering out the wrong interface, you'll be peering out the wrong, um, wrong IP address, You'll be trying to set it up the improper way. The TTL value will be wrong. Things have to match in order for this stuff to come up, which makes BGP almost as finicky as OSPF. Not quite as bad, but almost. Then you get into the open scent. The TCP connection is established, so that means that R1 and R2 can talk to each other on the, the appropriate connectivity information. The writing process sends an open message to the remote peer and transitions to the open scent state. The writing process can receive other open messages in the state. If the connection fails, the process goes transitions to the active state. You're still trying to actively open the connection. Now, the open receive op receives an open message, receives the open message from the remote peer and waits for the initial keep alive message from the remote peer. When that keep alive message is, re is received, the BGP writing process process transitions to the established state. If a notification is received, the BGP process transitions to the idle state. So at this point, you've agreed on everything. You're going to the process of doing capability exchange. So this is where the uh, rubber really meets the road for BGP. And at this point, if everything is good up to this point, then you go BGP established. The initial keep alive is received with, from the remote peer. Peering is now established with the remote neighbor, and the BGP writing process starts exchanging update messages with the remote peer. The whole timer restarts when an update or keep alive message is received. This is a good sign because it's basically is your hello happens before the dead timer expires. So the whole timer is uh, by default is three minutes or 180 seconds. The keep alive is every 60 seconds. So you should receive a keep alive every 60 seconds and that's going to keep the BGP at, uh, established connection open. If the BGP process receives an error notification, it will transition to the idle state. So what's an error notification? Notification itself is an issue with the connection. That might be the wrong autonomous system number, that might be the wrong IP address being sourced from the, uh, the TCP message, that could be the wrong uh, update source information, it really could be a lot of different things. So it could be the traffic, um, where the traffic is coming from, or where the traffic is going towards, the information inside of the information um, that you're receiving, I know it's kind of convoluted, but you'll see what this means in more detail when we actually get into it. And then you have potential cap capabilities exchange. You may be trying to form where a password is configured on one side and not the other. So there's several different aspects of how this comes into play. And you'll see what I mean when we actually get into it. I'll configure it right, then I'll configure it wrong. So you guys will see what this looks like and how to fix it. The BGP peering types... You have external BGP, which is neighbors outside of my autonomous system. You have internal BGP peers, which is neighbors inside my autonomous system. And update and pass selection rules change depending on what type of peer a route is being sent to or received from. So depending on how this goes, and you'll see what I mean by this when we get to it, I'm actually going to set it up to where we'll have, we're not going to get routing information set up correctly. It'll be a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step approach, and then you'll see it step-by-step you know, we'll get into the next top processing and stuff like that, and we'll set it correctly, and then all of a sudden, voila, things will start to work.